members. We have quite a list of testifiers on this bill. I'm sure most of you are aware. And so I'm going to um, help with some ground rules. First of all, in Senate gallery, we do not have demonstrations. So even though somebody tells a compelling story, we're going to ask you to not applaud. Um, I appreciate that courtesy. And then uh, we had indicated 20 minutes per side, but it will be the chair's discretion to go longer than that for either side of the argument. Uh, we have requested two minutes per presenter. I know there may be multiple presenters from a single organization, but keep in mind the testifier list is long, and so if you could do the courtesy of trying to be concise with your testimony. Um, if you have a letter, I would ask you to just raise the high points in that letter and encourage the committee to read it um, so that your voice becomes more important than the written word. Um, if someone has made your point before you, feel free to reference that they made your point and give us new information that they might not have brought to us today. Um, Additionally, if you have reference to specific language, it helps a great deal if you give us line and page as part of your testimony. And so um, I appreciate you all being here. I appreciate these courtesies uh, extended as part of our coming together to give testimony on this bill. And I welcome Senator Johnson. Um, Senate File 3611, Senator Matthews moves Senate File 3611 to be before the committee. Welcome to the committee. Thank you, Madam Chair and committee members. Uh, before I get going, I, I, I'd additionally like to thank uh, Senator Benson, Senator Rosen, and Senator Matthews uh, for co-authoring this bill. Um, I'd also like to thank the stakeholders, both uh, locally here, across the state, DHS, and those who have helped uh, with a lot of input in crafting this particular piece of legislation and getting into the form that it, that it is today. With that, uh, Madam Chair and members, there's a couple ways I could introduce this bill. Number one, just getting right into the meat of it. Um, Senator Johnson, I apologize. Would you like us to move the A1 amendment? That's how I'd like to start today. Okay, thank you. Senator Matthews moves the A1 amendment. We will treat this as an author's amendment. Members, there is a fiscal note, and um, believe that fiscal note uh, is drafted to the A1 amendment. So Senator Matthews. Correct moves the A1 amendment. All those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed? The amendment is adopted. Thank you, Senator Johnson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Members, as I was saying, uh, as a way of introducing my bill, I'd like to just start off with a, with a very short story uh, to kind of fill in a little bit of the background of why I think this bill is particularly important. So when I grew up, I had a neighbor and a schoolmate. Uh, she was born with severe physical disabilities. She had significant difficulties with movement because of a hereditary condition that interfered with her bone and muscle development. However, that didn't slow her down. She graduated from high school and then college, and now she's a physical education teacher in a rural school district. She's also a wife and a mother of two high-energy boys. She was also an MA recipient through her early life. But because of her strong drive to engage with the society and the economy, she is no longer receiving those MA benefits. I understand that she's an exceptional woman, and it's difficult to bootstrap your way off MA, but some may need a little extra incentive to do that. This bill is about encouraging healthy, able-bodied adults who are currently unemployed to re-engage with their communities. This bill simply asks that if an individual is physically able to work, they should be working, looking for work, in job training and education, if they're not caring for a child, or they should be volunteer, volunteering in their community. This committee will likely hear extensive testimony today, alleging that this bill will lead to kids, the elderly, disabled, single parents losing their coverage. Please don't be fooled by this. This bill is narrowly tailored to a specific group of healthy, able-bodied adults. Newly released data from the Department of, of Employment and Economic Development indicates that the, for the first time this year, there are more available jobs than individuals uh, looking for work. There has never been a better time to encourage more Minnesotans to look for work and to start filling some of these job openings. I have greatly appreciate the work done by the Department of Human Services and stakeholders on this bill and commit that I will continue to do so. 
Well, I do not necessarily agree with the assumption of DHS's fiscal note that we will see in just a few moments. Even if their cost assumptions are accurate, we can encourage 100,000 Minnesotans back into the workforce for $4 million price tag, which easily pays for itself. As an example for members, the legislature already appro uh, 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 apportioned $50 million this biennium for job support, workforce development, and employment programs. That's $50 million this biennium for jobs. If this bill results in 100,000 newly employed Minnesotans, it'll be one of the most cost-effective jobs bills this legislature has seen in years. Several other states have already begun the work, in particular Kentucky, Indiana, and Arkansas. Uh, so they have very similar programs. We're looking to build on their work and have been actively engaged in the, with the Department of Human Services to ensure that our proposal will be approved and will work across Minnesota. With that, Madam Chair, if I may, I would like to just do a brief overview of the 3611. Uh, Thank you, Madam Chair. So we'll start with subdivision one. This simply asks the Commissioner of Human Services to ask the federal government for a waiver. Uh, this will match the criteria of already in, uh, enacted SNAP and guidance from the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare Services. Now, through this waiver application, the Commissioner on lines 2.1 and 2.2 we'll consider input from the legislature and the public on strategies for criteria and the requirements and procedures when developing their final waiver application, which is, I believe, pretty impo very important for uh, crafting this in a way that will fit Minnesota. When we move down to subsection two, we get to those who are qualified individuals. The qualified individuals are therefore subject to the work requirements. Uh, so that's a large population, but starting on uh, subsection two, paragraph B, we begin to peel off those that are under uh, that are qualified. Um, so those who are on medical assistance, uh, who are not uh, um, persons eligible for medical assistance under provisions of Minnesota statute uh, 256B, who are not listed in paragraph A, would not be qualified individuals. The remaining of the population has an opportunity for an exemption. As you can see, we've got a long list of exemptions. Starting with one, pregnant. Number two, age 18 or younger and age 16 older. Working 30 hours a week or earning the federal minimum wage multiplied by 30 hours a week. A student, a sole or primary caregiver of somebody who's younger than 18. Somebody receiving permanent or temporary disability benefits from a private insurer medically frail, uh, deter, uh, somebody determined by the commissioner to be physically or mentally unfit for employment, subject to comply with work requirements uh, of the Minnesota Family Investment Program, or SNAP, um, or else, and finally, somebody that's enrolled in drug or substance abuse uh, treatment. So at this, at this point, we get to subsection three. And the commissioner through this whole process has a very large degree of latitude on defining the requirements for employment, uh, somebody who's seeking employment, or somebody that's participating in a work for a, for a program. These are the individuals now that, that are f underneath that work requirement, that don't match an exemption, and uh, so they've got to be involved in the community at some, uh, at some point. So these are the people that are employed, then that means that they're in the workforce something like 20 hours a week uh, or 80 hours a month is actively seeking employment, just like other programs like SNAP or TANF uh, ask for, or participates in a workfare program. So then we will move to subsection four. Now this is just the duties and additional requirements of the commissioner in defining the program and plan. Again, it really gives a lot of latitude to the commissioner to define this plan to or this the system to Minnesota and making sure that we are being compassionate and caring for those that truly need the benefits and what the program is truly meant for. 
Uh, and I'd, I'd like to draw your attention also to, at the very end of, st of that subsection four, the good cause exception that the commissioner uh, will be able to develop for uh, individual cases that may not meet standardized criteria. Um, I'm gonna uh, do a courtesy to our two commissioners who have come here today. We're going to have them testify first and then we'll be starting with those uh, who are testifying in favor. Uh, so, Mr. Chuck Johnson and Mr. Jeremy Hansen Willis, if you could please come up together. And um, for process purposes, we're going to people come up two at a time so that we have less transition. Okay. And uh, for the member of the public's benefit, we give our commissioners the courtesy to present what they need to present, they understand that we are time limited. And so, Mr. Uh, Commissioner Johnson, would you proceed, please? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and Committee. Uh, I'm Chuck Johnson. I serve as Acting Commissioner for the Department of Human Services. I will be brief. There are other uh, voices that I think are more important on this issue than mine. Uh, I wanted to be here to share that the Department of Human Services uh, opposes this bill uh, following, I believe people are aware, the governor sent a letter on Tuesday in opposition. In alignment with the governor's uh, statement, our primary concern is that this bill puts up barriers to health care and will cost people, by our estimate, 16,000 by 2021, fewer people receiving health care through our public programs. We think that's a move backwards from where we have been. We have been working for years to try to provide more coverage to more people in Minnesota and feel like this is the wrong direction to be moving at this point. We're also concerned that the underlying assumption uh, behind the bill is not correct in that most uh, people on Medicaid do work, 80% uh, according to the current population survey of Medicaid cases had a working uh, adult in them, non elderly or non-disabled. We also view healthcare as really being a support for work, not being a lever or a tool or of coercion to help people work, but really being a support that working people need in order to be able to uh, stay in the labor market and be successful. We're also concerned about the complexity uh, that this bill will create. Uh, I appreciate the author's intent to create exemption categories, good cause. Um, we know from our experience with MFIP and SNAP that there's a lot of work that has to go into making those kinds of things work on the ground. We're talking about tens of thousands of Minnesotans interacting with thousands of county workers across 87 counties, uh, and that's a very complex system. Uh, and during that, a lot can go wrong. And what we know happens from our own studies as well as studies now nationally when people are sanctioned, or in this case, I have their health care suspended, they're often the people who have the most difficulty managing through those processes. People who have mental illness, people who have substance use disorder, other kinds of disabilities. So that is an additional concern for us uh, as well. So I just want to share that the department uh, does oppose this bill. We're concerned about uh, people losing health care, putting up barriers to health care. We believe it moves us backwards. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you and Mr. Hinson Willis. Yes, Madam Chair, thank you. Again, my name is Jeremy Hansen Willis. I'm the Deputy Commissioner for Workforce Development at the Minnesota Employment, uh, Department of Employment and Economic Development, otherwise known as DEED. And I also thank you for the opportunity to express our concerns today in opposition to this legislation. And all the bulk of the concerns uh, are with DHS, and, uh, but we thought it was important that you understand as the state's Workforce Development Agency, DEED has specific concerns about how the bill would negatively affect our Workforce Center system considered among the nation's uh, most strongest and effective systems. Given that this is not something that the committee spends a lot of time on, I thought I would just briefly make sure you understand that Minnesota's Workforce Center system is comprised of 48 physical locations and online services all across the state uh, overseen by DEED and managed by 16 local workforce boards and six regional plans. These centers are created, governed, and funded by the Federal Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act. The federal funds that support these spaces and staff who provide vital career services to Minnesota's employers and career seekers. The centers serve the needs of employers by organizing job fairs, hiring events, and other services to directly connect employers to career seekers. It provides information on tax credits, apprenticeships, job training, and grants, and offers seminars on talent, recruitment, and retention, and engages businesses in industry sector partnerships. In addition to providing services to our employers and businesses, we serve career seekers by providing individualized skills assessment and career planning, 
labor market and in-demand job opportunities, job search skills, including how to use online job search sites, social media, resume writing, interviewing, and networking. In 2017, Minnesota's Workforce Center system served 419,000 Minnesotans, actually almost 420,000 Minnesota career seekers. And our workforce centers serve every Minnesotans of every education level, race, and age. 39% of our career seekers are college graduates. 53% are high school graduates, and 8% have less than a high school GED. This is good and important work that our workforce centers provide. So our concern is that components of Senate File 3611, especially lines 6.16 to 3.17, call for those who are subject to the work requirements to demonstrate that they're actively seeking employment, engaged in career planning, job training, referral, or job support services, or a combination of activities listed in this clause for at least 80 hours per month. It is this requirement that we estimate would double the number of clients who receive case management services through our workforce center system without providing any additional resources. This doubling would, sig would place a significant administrative burden on our workforce centers along with the city, county, state, and nonprofit staff who deliver these employment services with no additional resources. As a result, this unfunded state magnate would divert primarily federal resources away from our current customers and risk turning our job counselors from career enablers to timesheet enforcers. Additionally, our workforce development IT systems are not designed to capture the type of information called for in the bill or to pause a person's, person's benefits. The bill would require us to have a significant investment in staffing and IT to develop, manage, track, and verify compliance that we don't track today and would derail us from other priorities such as system modernization. We estimate that it would take a build out of our IT systems, it would take approximately one and a half years to accomplish the kind of build out required to track this information. As a result, resources would also be required to train and support a significant number of new city, county, state, and nonprofit staff who use this case management system. And finally, as the governor noted in his communications to you, these costly efforts would do nothing to address the structural barriers that we know prevent people from working, such as the limited availability of childcare, lack of transportation and stable housing, discrimination, or a criminal history. Childcare and transportation barriers are especially compounded by atypical or irregular work hours, more common in low wage jobs. And these issues are particularly acute in rural Minnesota. At a time when Minnesota's employers face a real and growing skilled labor shortage, now is not the time to divert limited federal resources or significantly increase the staffing and IT cost without providing additional funding. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. And uh, members, we have one person prepared to uh, present in favor, Mr. Jason Flores. If you could please come forward and then next on my list, if you want to um, start preparing, I have Sue Abderholden, Sarah Orange, Patrick Ness, and Susie Emmert Schatz. If uh, you could be prepared when Mr. Flores finishes his testimony. Mr. Flores, welcome to the committee. Uh, two minutes, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, members, my name is Jason Flores. I'm the State Director for Americans for Prosperity's chapter here in Minnesota. And I'm here today on behalf of our activists to speak in support of this Senate file. Minnesota's long been an outlier for very generous uh, government-run health care programs. You remember even before Obamacare expansion, we had one of the most generous programs in the nation, more generous even than many states after they expanded, thanks to Obamacare, and then we expanded on top of that as well. Now, while advocates would laud that coverage, that explosive enrollment following enactment of Obamacare has created problems for taxpayers and for Medicaid recipients. Medicaid's already nearly a third of the budget and growing, and that status quo is an absolute budget buster that will lead to cuts to the programs, cuts to Medicaid services, drastic and painful tax increases, or a combination of all of them. In fact, the governor already in the supplemental budget has proposed a billion dollar tax increase through reinstatement of the provider tax. Now, even worse than that impact on the state budget is the impact on thousands of Minnesotans. 
The expansion of Medicaid to able-bodied, childless, working-age adults crowds out the availability of services for those who need these services the most, the elderly, the disabled, pregnant mothers, single mothers. Like many government-run programs, the structure of Medicaid robs able-bodied, working-age adults of the dignity of earned success by disincentivizing work and higher earnings, lest they lose eligibility and benefits. Now, that's not a, uh, a criticism of them. That's simply a rational response to the disincentives that government has put in place. At a time when we need workers, as we do now, why are we disincentivizing re-entry to the workforce? Our focus should be the exact opposite. Our focus should not be to cut people off services, but through work, through skills training, through job training, to expand their opportunities and ultimately move beyond their need for these programs. The approach in this bill is a significant departure from the status quo. It protects the neediest Minnesotans and preserves the safety net for their well-being. A flexible work requirement and job training requirement that even includes volunteering as a satisfactory condition to uh, what's required here is an important first step to uplift struggling Minnesotans who, like all people, deserve the dignity of earned success while also beginning to provide relief to state pack taxpayers. Thank you so much for your time here today. Um, be happy to um, talk with anyone uh, after this meeting if you have questions or concerns. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Flores. Next, uh, Ms. Abderholden, Ms. Orange on deck, be, uh, Mr. Patrick Ness, and Susie emmerich -Shots. Welcome to the committee. Senator Hayden. Good. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. I just had a bit of a process question. I appreciate the expediency that we're going. But if we have testifiers on either side that we want to question or disagree with, I want to know more about how, how do we, should we just wait to the end, write it down, or is it appropriate for us to ask them after their testimony? I would appreciate it, Senator Hayden, if we could hold member questions so that we are time limited in this room and I'd like the public to have full opportunity to make their voices heard and we will always have time to have our conversations. Good. Well, then, Madam Chair, can we make sure that those, especially those professional testifiers, uh, stick around um, so that if we have questions of them, we can ask them? Thank you, Senator Hayden. Noted that those of you who are regulars at the Capitol, if you could stay till the end, we would appreciate it. Senator Lurie. Uh, Madam Chair, what, what is our time limit in um, this room? We have been asked to vacate at 445. So really? approximately an hour. Who, who has asked us that? I might I, go talk to because we might need more than an hour to get through this massive change to how we deliver care to the most needy across the state of Minnesota. We might need more than an hour to work through this. Um, Senator Lloyd, so believe, who has asked? I believe state government is scheduled to be in here tonight. I think quite a few committees have left, Madam Chair. I think we might be able to find another room to make sure that we actually actively listen to the people of Minnesota who have significant concerns about this. So I would ask, Madam Chair, that you not try to finish this really most important hearing that we've had all year in less than an hour. Um, Senator Lurie, we, we did notice we're trying to be fair. Um, obviously, those who would be in favor of this bill are not going to take the full 20 minutes. I'm trying to get through everybody who has asked to testify so the committee can hear um, what is going on and then member discussion. Um, can continue. Uh, Senator Lurie. I would like to ask on the record, Madam Chair, that we find a place to make sure that we actually listen to the people of Minnesota who have concerns about this bill and that members of this committee have the respect to have the time to ask important questions. This is very transformative change. I actually agree with the last testifier. This is incredibly transformative. And, and I'm not going to you know, launch into some of the things that I'm going to go into, but we're going to need more than an hour. Noted. Thank you, Senator Lurie. Um, we will do our best to accommodate the public who have come, and then we will work with members after that. Thank you. 
Ms. Abderholden, and I did ask for uh, Ms. Orange to come forward as well. Um, so if we could come up two by two, Ms. Abderholden, welcome to the committee. Thank you, Madam Chair, members. Sue Abderholden, NAMI, Minnesota. Uh, Medicaid expansion did not reduce the number of people working. It increased the number of people who could access health care, particularly mental health care. Schizophrenia, depression, bipolar disorder, anxiety, PTSD, all mental illnesses whose symptoms can interfere with everyday life, including work. Symptoms such as confused thinking or problems concentrating and learning, difficulties understanding or relating to other people, changes in sleeping habits or feeling tired and low energy, difficulty perceiving reality such as delusions or hallucinations, symptoms that can worsen without access to treatment. The exemptions in this bill won't help many people with mental illness and they will once again fall through the cracks. The barriers for people with mental illness when it comes to employment include the length and severity of the illness, lack of access to mental health treatment, educational opportunities, lack of work experience, as well as prejudice and discrimination. For people with mental illness, a largely invisible illness with fluctuating symptoms, it is very difficult to become certified as disabled. You must experience symptoms for a year to qualify. You have to prove you can't work, which means you need doctor statements and medical records. It takes about a year for the determination to be made, and 65% of applicants are denied the first time. So what happens during those years when someone isn't covered by Medicaid? And why would we tell a 24-year-old recently diagnosed with schizophrenia that the only way he can get treatment he needs to get better is to tell the Social Security Administration that he will never work again? Three months is the average wait time to see a psychiatrist, so what happens when the three months of Medicaid are up and they have to start looking for work and are still experiencing symptoms that prevent them from being successfully employed? People with mental illnesses want to work, but they need treatment and support to address their symptoms. And they have, we have very, very few employment programs designed to help people with mental illness. Every month we delay treatment, we increase the severity of the symptoms and the level of care needed. So instead of an outpatient mental health appointment, they are seen in an emergency room and hospitalized at a far greater cost. Every month we delay treatment, we increase the probability that the person will come into contact with the criminal justice system, increasing the public safety costs for police, jails, and court systems. And every month we ask for paperwork, the probability that someone's symptoms will interfere and it won't get done increase. Families went bankrupt covering the cost of mental health care before Medicaid expansion and mental health parity, and lack of access to insurance that covers mental health treatment leads to greater out-of-pocket costs for families. The word dignity has been talked and tossed around a lot in regards to this bill. Well, you lose your dignity when you have untreated mental illness. Hearing voices, having delusional thoughts, depression so deep you can't get out of bed, becoming isolated and losing your purpose in life. This bill will not create dignity for people with mental illness. It will do the opposite. Please vote no. Thank, Thank you, you. Ms. Abderholden, Ms. Orange, and then Madam Patrick. Chair, yes. just yes. a moment. I'm just wondering, uh, why I think with the, when we have a little bit shorter time, I would hope that maybe we could switch to one minute instead of two, just because I, it'd be, I know that it is really important, Senator Laurie, but I think it's also really important to have each person have an opportunity to be at the table. And, and Senator Kiffmeyer, I would appreciate if we could have two minutes. Ms. Abderholden did go over and that is noted and I hope that we improve as we go. Thank you. Ms. Orange, please proceed. Madam Chair, honorable committee members, my name is Sarah Orange. I'm here on behalf of the Minnesota Budget Project. The Minnesota Budget Project strongly opposes SF 3611, which would require significant investment in new bureaucracy and paperwork that would be better spent addressing health care needs of Minnesotans. The fiscal note demonstrates that this bill creates a net loss for Minnesota. The bill will spend more than $14 million of taxpayer money over biennium's 18, 19, and 20, and 21, simply to pay for new bureaucracy and paperwork systems. The savings accrue to the state for no longer paying for medical assistance services for 25,000 unique individuals who are, protect, who are projected to lose health care coverage every year is simply not enough to offset the burdensome administrative costs and increased costs to our health care system. 
This fiscal note also does not address the substantial cost of complying with the proposed requirements that will fall on our counties. When we look at Kentucky, which is also currently implementing similar work requirements in their Medicaid program at a price of $187.5 million for one year, it becomes clear that this bill intends to pass millions of dollars of spending down to our counties. Minnesota counties are already indicating that this will lead to increased property taxes or diverting funds from other essential services. And all of this in order to find 25,000 people on medical assistance every year who are deemed to be undeserving by this bill, but are likely working already or face significant barriers to work. If the ultimate goal of this bill is to increase the number of Minnesotans working and to decrease Minnesota's health care spending, it fails on both accounts. This money is better invested in job training programs or seeking to improve public health outcomes. I strongly urge you to oppose this bill. Thank you, um, Mr. Metz, and then Ms. Schatz. Thank you, Madam Chair, members. My name is Patrick Ness. I'm the Public Policy Director with the Wilder Foundation and a co-convener along with our next testifier of the This Is Medicaid Coalition. Uh, you have a sign-on letter from 116 Minnesota organizations uh, opposed to this legislation. Many of our organizations work directly with low-income Minnesotans. We are doctors and nurses and clinics and hospitals and mental health and chemical dependency counselors, advocates for people with disabilities and older adults. We work with people with chronic conditions and rare diseases, people experiencing homelessness, health plans, and Minnesotans struggling to make ends meet. 116 Minnesota organizations who share the goal of work, but not this strategy. We assume only the best of intent of those moving this legislation. Uh, work is the pathway uh, that we can all agree to, including enrollees of medical assistance. This strategy, however, will result in more uninsured Minnesotans. Medicaid is a health care program, and it has been for over 50 years. It has not been conditional on work. It's not in the goals or in the statute of the program, and that's why there would likely be a legal challenge uh, to this legislation. It cannot be a conditional. If work, then health care. For 50 years, the promise of Medicaid has been, if extremely low income, then health care. If disability, then health care. If older adult in need of care, then health care. That has been the promise of Medicaid. This is a personal issue for me as well. My father, who spent 30 years as a pastor in northern Minnesota, at the age of 56, was restructured out of his job. He looked for work for two years and couldn't find anything. He said, I would have taken a job as an overnight janitor. I would have done whatever. But it, whether it was my age or my skills or something else about me, I couldn't get work. At age 58, he experienced Mr. more health conditions. Mr. Ness? Yes. I, we're, we're running into the habit of going over time. I, I, re I, I respect the position that you're in. Members, please hear the voices of Minnesota. Please vote this bill down today. Thank you so Ms. much. Ms. Schatz and then Ms. Quincy. And for those of you who are at the Capitol regularly, you know why we put two minutes on. Member of the public, get a little more grace. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. My name is Susie Emmert Schatz, and I'm from Lutheran Social Service of Minnesota, and I help to co convene the This Is Medicaid Coalition. Our vision at LSS is that all people have the opportunity to live and work in community with full and abundant lives. We work every day to help people overcome barriers to work. The impact of this bill would have difficult consequences on the many people that we support. Josh is a young man who's been supported in our homeless youth services. He's 20 years old, he's productive, and he has worked very hard to obtain and maintain his housing and employment. He suffers from severe depression and PTSD from a traumatic childhood spent mostly in foster care. He attends weekly therapy sessions, takes medication for sleep and managing depression, and they are vital to his functioning. He found a job that, in retail that works so far, and he's at working 15 hours a week. He wants to be full-time employed. He wants to go to school and do all these things. He cannot right now. Due to chronic sleep issues and complications with his depression, he has lost jobs. 
but he has never stopped wanting and trying to work. If Josh were to lose health care, even temporarily, in the circumstances set up by this propo proposal, he, it would be severely damaging to his ability to remain, remain productive. His requirements that interrupt or complicate this process for Josh and many others keep, that keep them going to work would seriously jeopardize any future success. Investments in mental health and medical care at key moments in life are critical and pay dividends into the future. Josh's doctor, the people trying to help him live, do not want him to be on SSI. He will have to declare himself permanently disabled. We do not want his doctor to have to say he is mentally or un physically unfit for work. This is the position that people are being placed in with this bill. This bill adds further complication and insurmountable obstacles to already very complicated situations and systems. All of us professional lobbyists come here because we want to make medical assistance better. And this does not do that. Yes, Madam Chair and committee members, my name is Ann Quincy. I'm the supervising attorney of legal aid of Minneapolis's public benefits unit. Um, I also rise to speak in opposition to Senate file 3611, which proposes to have the commissioner seek an 1115 waiver of provisions of the Medicaid Act to add work requirements to the eligibility criteria for certain MA beneficiaries and to suspend the MA benefits of any of those enrollees who do not meet those work requirements. Others will have pointed out the costs, the cost to MA beneficiaries, the cost to Minnesota in lost federal funds that would have paid for their health coverage, the huge administrative cost to counties. I'd like to just talk to the cost to the state of defending expensive legal challenges like those already being mounted in other states. Legal Aid and other advocates have been following the progress of those legal challenges, and I believe the HHS's secretary's invitation to states to submit these waivers and states seeking to implement the work such work requirements are challengeable for several reasons. First, MA 1115 waivers have to further the objectives of the Medicaid program. The evidence is very slim that CMS is about face on the efficacy of work requirements after so many years of opposing them in improving health outcomes is supported by the facts. The author of the Senate file 3611 does not point to any improvement expected in someone's health, only state fiscal savings. 1115 waivers also have to be budget neutral and cannot rely on producing savings from disenrolling beneficiaries. Waiver requests put forth by every other state and touted by proponents of 3611 all bank savings based on cutting people off Medicaid. Last, Medicaid cannot and the federal government will not fund the employment and training components of Medicaid work requirements. Again, every other state seeking one of these waivers has included in their budgets that the federal government will pay for ENT. But CMS has made very clear that Medicaid money cannot be used for this purpose, and the governor of Kentucky last week finally acknowledged that the ENT costs of the MA work requirements in that state will total more than $167 million, and Kentucky will pay for that, not the federal government. For all these reasons, Senate File 3611 will not save the state of Minnesota money, and I urge you to oppose it. Thank you. Thank you. Could I have Ms. Hust and Ms. Rootmeyer, followed by Ms. Beaver and Ms. Krinky? Madam Chair, while they come up. Senator Lori. Um, I've gotten a couple of messages. The sergeant, uh, I'm, I'm told the sergeants believe we can stay in this room. If not, we've also got uh, G3 over in the Capitol reserved all night. So. We can if continue the, the discussion. If the sergeants would like to communicate with us, they can. And then yeah. hopefully they'll communicate with you as well. Thank you. Um, Ms. Hust, Ms. Rittmeyer, yes. please proceed. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, committee members. My name is Dr. Ann Catherine Hust. I'm a general internist, a primary care physician, and the medical director for two uh, Hennepin Healthcare's adult primary care clinics at HCMC in downtown Minneapolis. I'm here today to testify against Senate File 3611. We have serious concerns about the impact of this bill on our patients and on our financial stability. At HCMC, we firmly believe everyone should have access to health care. 
though employment, education, and community service are goals worth our time and energy, this bill does nothing to help our patients find or keep a job. The cost of this bill is measurable. At HCMC alone, we estimate this bill could cost anywhere from $7.9 to $15 million a year in uncompensated care. What can't be measured is the negative impact on people's health, dignity, and safety when there's a disruption in their health care. About half of our patients are covered by Medicaid at HCMC and they face chronic health conditions and multiple social barriers. One out of every three patients we see has serious mental illness and or a substance use disorder. One out of five struggles with homelessness and is living without adequate access to food. One out of three is in deep poverty, making less than $500 a month. Though well intended, the exemptions in this bill are unworkable and unrealistic. People's lives and their unique conditions are un unique and unpredictable. They can't be easily carved out in the statute. It is not enough to stabilize health conditions only when someone is in treatment, temporarily unwell, frail, or in a crisis. Rather, it's vital that coverage continue so an individual can avoid relapses, a relapse of asthma, of heart failure, of diabetes, of depression, all things that are practical daily conditions I see in my practice, and all things we can prevent. People with chronic health conditions, mental illness, and addiction are on cycles of recovery, cycles that require follow-up visits, support services, counseling, and medication assistance. Cycles long, but can be transformative for their lives. Instead of adding more barriers to our patients' lives, we urge lawmakers to focus on investing in policies and programs that will improve people's access to care, as well as improved employment opportunities. In closing, please continue to support the people of Minnesota. Their health matters to all of us. As one of my patients, Tina, wrote to me and my clinic team, being here at my clinic has given me back my humanity. Thank you for your time and consideration on this important matter. Thank you, Ms. Rittmeyer. And then Ms. Beaver and Ms. Krenke. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Um, I will do my best to stay within the time frame, but I ask for a little grace as I've driven five and a half hours to be here to testify. Thank you. Um, for the record, my name is Shauna Reitmeyer and I am with the Northwestern Mental Health Center. We are the only comprehensive chemical and mental health provider in Senator Johnson's district. We serve six rural and frontier counties that include Kitson, Marshall, Norman, Polk, Monoman, and Red Lake. Last year, we served over 4,000 people. 70% of them have Medicaid. While I understand this bill creates exemptions for many individuals, what this does for those that we currently serve is it will add added anxiety and stress caused by the continual monitoring of whether or not they have coverage and it will create a further challenge on their striving towards their own recovery. And with respect to Senator Johnson's bill, I have grave concerns of what this bill will do to the people we do not serve now because they will not have coverage and they will not even be able to seek out the needed mental or chemical health care. You see, people with mental health issues many times go untreated. They work, struggle to maintain their employment, lose their employment, and the cycle is repeated over and over again. But the fact is, most of the people we do serve have employment, but that is because of the supportive services available through Medicaid that we provide. They are designed to support people in gaining employment. So tell me, how someone who does not have coverage because they do not have a job get the services they need to get a job without the coverage to get the service? For the behavioral health care community, we are already strapped with workforce shortages, long wait times to access to care, and being in a rural frontier area that is even more profound. This bill adds an additional barrier to coverage for people with individual, with uh, mental and chemical health issues. This bill also shifts the costs. Um, it's gonna cost the state more to administer, but instead of saving money, it's shifting that to providers like me, like mine. We do not turn people away based on their ability to pay. If someone does not have Medicaid, we absorb that cost. And if 70% of our population have Medicaid and of the group this bill is targeting, we will now have to come up with additional revenue to cover that service provided. We will have to add additional staff, manage the eligibility process, and the denied claims of people going on and off of coverage. 
But most of all, an arbitrary line is being drawn as to who is worthy and who is not worthy of health care. So I urge you to consider these impacts to the people served by my agency that live in Northwest Minnesota and across the state. I urge you to vote no on this bill and thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Ruttmeyer, Ms. Beaver, and Ms. Krinke. Ms. Nilsen, on deck, please. Welcome. Thank you. Madam Chair, members of the committee, I'm Ellie Beaver. I'm the Minnesota Government Relations Director for the American Cancer Society Cancer Action Network. We're the nonprofit, nonpartisan advocacy affiliate of the American Cancer Society and support evidence-based policy and legislative solutions designed to eliminate cancer as a major health problem. Over 31,000 Minnesotans will be diagnosed with cancer this year, many of whom are receiving health care coverage through the Minnesota Medicaid program. Individuals with lower socioeconomic status have higher cancer incidence and higher death rates. Medicaid has increased use of preventative care, leading to increased early detection of cancers and improved survival rates for patients and survivors. It helps low-income cancer patients and survivors manage their disease and maintain a good quality of life. Medicaid is a critical safety net in the fight against cancer. Cancer patients in active treatment are often unable to work or require modifications in their employment due to their treatment, and between 40 and 85% of them stop working, with absences ranging between 45 days to six months. Imposing a work or community engagement requirement as a condition of eligibility for Medicaid could result in cancer patients, survivors, and other people managing serious chronic conditions being denied access to timely, appropriate, and life-saving health care and treatment services. Losing access to health care coverage can make it difficult or impossible for someone to have their cancer diagnosed at an earlier, more treatable stage. For a patient who is mid-treatment, losing health care coverage could seriously jeopardize their chance of survival. Losing access to your care team could be a matter of life or death for a cancer patient or survivor, and the financial toll that losing coverage would have on individuals and their families could be devastating. Work requirements could result in those at risk for cancer and cancer survivors being unable to access the only safety net coverage option available. We oppose Medicaid work requirements because cancer patients, survivors, and those who will be diagnosed with the disease, as well as those with other complex chronic conditions, could find themselves without health care coverage options. Maintaining access to health care coverage and services is a matter of life and survivorships for thousands of low-income cancer patients and survivors, and therefore we oppose this bill and ask that you vote no. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Krinke, followed by Ms. Nilsen, Mr. Kerr, and Mr. Riley. Great. Madam Chair and members of the committee, for the record, my name is Mary Krinke, and I'm with the Minnesota Hospital Association. Last session, the legislature allocated $327 million to help offset some of the insurance premium costs for individuals who had purchased their policies in the individual market. That legislation benefited individuals who made more than 400% of the federal poverty guidelines. That was for 2017 policies. Then the legislature passed a reinsurance bill for 2018 and 19 policies, allocating $471 million, once again to lower premiums for individuals purchasing insurance in the individual market. These bills were a recognition that health care insurance is expensive and that government has a role in helping some people pay for the cost of their insurance. The Minnesota Hospital Association has had a long-held position that government should pay for the health care coverage for low-income Minnesotans. The individuals potentially impacted by this legislation all make less than 138% of the federal poverty guidelines. That's less than $16,000 a year. If middle income earners are having a hard time paying for the cost of their health insurance, clearly someone earning less than $16,000 a year will not be able to purchase insurance. Of course, hospital uncompensated care will go up as the number of people without insurance will go up, and the portion of those costs will be borne by other payers. In closing, it is important to remember that the federal government pays 90% of the costs of the health care insurance for this population. The other populations in the Medicaid program, it's a 50% match. This is a 90% federal match. That money is helping this population get healthier with access to health care services. This money is supporting our hospitals around the state, clinics, and all health care providers who care for the medical assistance population. We urge you to oppose this legislation. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Ms. Nilsen and then Mr. Kerr and Mr. Riley. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and committee members. My name is Monica Nilsson. I have worked with people experiencing homelessness for 25 years. 
Last year, I opened a overnight winter shelter in Dakota County. I turned away people from Washington, Scott, Carver, and Olmstead counties. People stay in shelter seeking to maintain their blood sugar, refrain from vomiting with the flu, abstain until they can get into treatment, or restrain the demons in their heads who no one is helping leave behind. The shelter will close again in two days, Easter Sunday. Winter is over. People will get gas cards or bus cards, not for transportation, but for a safe haven. Steps from here, hours from now, people will gather on the light rail for a place to sleep. 1 a.m., I leave a homeless girl trying to sleep on the train. Her PTSD leaves her to jump with each person who walks by. I worry about her sexual health as she tries to sleep surrounded by strangers. 2 a.m., a seemingly brain-injured, drooling man has his chin wiped by another homeless man before sleeping under lights all night. I worry that his cognitive health makes him vulnerable. 3 a.m., David reports that he has an appointment at the VA. He hopes to get benefits soon. His tooth is killing him. I worry about his chemical health as he tries to take another sip of vodka to dull the pain in his mouth and heart. 4 a.m., sleep deprivation isn't a disability, but it certainly impacts our physical health and makes it difficult to work. Would you be confident as an employer that these able bodies could come prepared to work for you? 5 a.m., a homeless 19-year-old tells me, I have an interview coming up for J.C. Penney. Do you have any clean socks? 6 a.m., a homeless Amazon worker tells me, it's not that you can't find a job, you can't keep one because you're always getting sick or falling asleep. Please do not set conditions to accessing health care when it is the very bootstrap that it holds up their able body. Thank you. Mr. Kerr and then Mr. Riley, followed by Mr. Varco and Mr. Hermer. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and community members. My name is Josh Kerr. As someone who has had life-saving care through medical assistance, I appreciate you listening to me today. Before my health took a turn for the worse, I had a better life. I had connections to family and friends, and I worked in the property management field. Following the removal of my gallbladder in 2007, I was prescribed painkillers. I developed a bad infection and a bad addiction to those prescribed medications. I was then found to have an infected heart valve. I was hospitalized for six weeks, followed by another six weeks of intensive inpatient treatment. I began to, part <clears throat> excuse me, I began to participate in an outpatient methadone clinic in Woodbury when I received life-changing news again. It was confirmed that I had cancer. Cancer meant no methadone, Illness met work loss, which meant loss of housing. I was without a stable place to rest Christmas week of 2016. I consider myself a spiritual person. I listened to Christian music, KTIS, and was spending a lot of time in my vehicle as it had become my home. There was no shelter in Washington County. I was in a parking lot in Woodbury, depressed, amidst a lot of medication bottles, but having halted my health care because I didn't have a place to rest and considering the consequences of life not continuing as I was clinging to life. I am fortunate to be cancer free as of June 2017. Life is still difficult though. Ongoing heart issues last fall led to additional medications bringing the total monthly cost of my prescribed medications to over $1,500 per month. I was cut from food benefits and SNAP four months ago because I am unable to work study and now I fear losing my housing. People think I would be receiving disability income, but I'm not disabled. I have been sick. As some weeks are good, other weeks I am unfit to work. My fitness to work is day to day, 
and week to week. I will end with hope though. Despite all that you have heard, I have been sober since August of 2015. Despite having my food support cut, I am here today with the energy to try and make a difference. My chemical health issues aren't opiates anymore. They're how do I get that fresh fruit every day. My life will be devastated without health care. I'm doing my best, and because I now have stable housing and I have health care, I expect to improve to have meaningful engagement in our community once again. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Mr. Kerr, Mr. Riley, and then Mr. Varko, Ms. Hermer. Good afternoon, Madam Ch Chairman and committee members. My name is Willie Riley. I am an honorable discharge U.S. Army veteran and medical assistance enrollee. <clears throat> when I returned to Minnesota from Fort McClellan, Alabama, and Fort Lee, Virginia, where my AIT unit was stationed, I brought home stressors. <clears throat> I returned with the work ethic, and I've worked and tried to work all my life. I've done remodeling, carpentry, cooking, janitorial, and customer service. Despite having a long work history, I've never had a job that offered a health plan. <clears throat> I've never had a job that offered weeks of paid time off. <clears throat> People with good jobs that have paid time off can call in and take a day or a week off <clears throat> when they are going to miss work. I can't. People like me who work at restaurants, you might eat at, we lose our jobs. <clears throat> I thank God for this health care. I learned 20 years ago that I have manic depression, PTSD, and anxiety. This health care has allowed me <clears throat> to see an African-American therapist, and that helps. I have taken mental health medications in the past, but seeing a therapist has meant I didn't need the medicine. I have a primary doctor and use primary clinics through UCARE so the emergency rooms can be used for what they're supposed to be used for, emergencies. I have a physical health concern as well, primarily my back. I have a chronic condition that began while in the military, but with medical assistance and through medicine and physical therapy, I may be able to avoid costly surgery. The loss of all of this because I don't work one month would be devastating. Just the thought of it causes worry. I wish my country loved me as much as I love my country. While I have my own housing, I didn't always. We have so many homeless veterans. I know this lady, she was a major, living out of a car. I know there's some help coming for veterans, but it's not enough. So people say to us, just go to the VA and they'll take care of you. Veterans like me know we may not be able to get care in the time that we need it by the VA. Listen, <clears throat> oh, some people say you just need to pull up your bootstraps. <clears throat> Listen, I've worn boots probably more than many people in this room. What do you think I've been trying to do? I was willing to, pre to protect our country. Now, now I'm asking for you to protect me. And in closing, <clears throat> I really love my country. You know, I love a lot of things about this country. And to me, it seems like the less fortunate always catch the shaft, you know. Um, take away our health care, take away the things that provide us for stable and healthy living. Um, I don't make much money. I don't have a good job. Um, I wish some of y'all could take a week off or, and just be homeless for a week and see what it's like, see what they go through. You know, it's not easy out here. And putting more stipulations on us is not helping us. It's just making things worse. And with that, I close. Thank you.
Thank you, Mr. Riley, Mr. Varco, Ms. Hermer, Mr. McCourt. Madam Chair, my name is Rick Varco, Political Director, SEIU Healthcare Minnesota. We oppose Senate File 3611. In other forums, our members have talked about how work requirements are a barrier to work, especially for PCAs with irregular schedules and health conditions. You are hearing similar testimony today. The author may express a desire to work on the exceptions language so that these requirements fall on the, only on the truly able-bodied. But that simply highlights a fundamental flaw in the bill. It starkly divides people into the undeserving able-bodied and the sick who deserve care. People do not neatly fall into these two distinct categories and government is ill-equipped to sort them. I'm especially concerned about the exceptions on lines 3.3 and 3.4. Many PCAs have ongoing chronic conditions that make it hard to work without health care. For example, Deb Housey, an SEIU PCA, told the House that she has a bad knee and a bad heart. The doctor, doctor recommended she seek disability, but she keeps working, maybe not always 20 hours a week, because she cares about her client and she believes in the value of work. Under this system, every month, her health, even her life, will be at risk to the decision of some harassed caseworker operating antiquated technology. As Representative Zerwas said last night, quote, this is a state government that can't print a license plate. In this case, he continued, when we're talking about Medicaid, quote, when they get it wrong, it's not a 21-day sticker. It's someone not going to the doctor. There are better ways to save Medicaid dollars and better ways to reduce the cost of care. I urge you to oppose this bill. Thank you, Mr. Hermer, Mr. McCourt, or I'm sorry, Ms. Hermer, Mr. McCourt, and Ms. Leff. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for the opportunity to testify regarding Senate File 3611. My name is Laura Hermer. I'm a professor of law at Mitchell Hamlin School of Law. Um, I teach in the area of health law, and much of my research has concerned Medicaid, specifically personal responsibility requirements, such as what is before you tonight in Section 1115 waivers in Medicaid. First, there's nothing fiscally prudent about this bill. The fiscal note concluded that the bill would not save Minnesota money, but in fact cost it. Over 16,000 people would lose coverage and not one job other than 65.5 new state government FTEs would be created. Now, if, if this bill is really about saving money rather than helping people work, and there's little evidence in the bill that it is meant to help people work, then it would be much cheaper to simply repeal the Medicaid expansion outright, really. It's within your power to do, but it would be bad policy. Medical assistance is not a welfare program. It is, for most non-disabled adults, a work support program. <coughs> Taking medical assistance away from single childless adults would push them into middle-income jobs that offer health insurance. Then Texas, where I used to live, Mississippi, Alabama, and other such states would be largely free from poverty, but of course their poverty levels are far worse than our own. We know that work requirements in TANF and SNAP push people off the rules, but they don't typically lift people out of poverty. One major meta-analysis of TANF research studies found that those who left TANF typically found intermittent part-time work that usually left them in poverty and moreover did not have employer-sponsored <coughs> health insurance. They had no coverage. That is what medical assistance, this Medicaid expansion, is for. As you all have likely heard from your constituents, even if a Minnesotan on medical assistance eventually gets a middle income job, he will still have serious problems paying for health care. A Minnesotan earning $50,000 a year usually only takes home about $39,000. Um, and then, of course, to uh, have employer-sponsored coverage and use that coverage, it will cost about $8,500 if they have a lot of health care needs. We won't fix the problem of inordinately expensive medical care by restricting access to MA. Thank you for your time and attention. I'd be happy to take your questions. Thank you, Mr. McCourt and uh, Senta Leff, followed by Commissioner Higgins. <coughs> Welcome to the committee. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have the privilege of serving in multiple capacities across the state, but I'm here today representing the larger autism community and as a self-advocate expressing my concerns with Senate File 3611. The bill reminds me very much of the beginning of our welfare safety net in 1890, where, which was designed around the concept of, of, of treating Civil War veterans and designed to prevent dependency. 
Amputees were heroes, but an intermittent fever caused by contracting malaria was that worthy of government funding? That underlying question is exactly the criticism of critics here today. Despite the pledge that there will be exemptions for those living with disabilities like myself, I continue to be concerned about the state deciding what qualifies as disabled, and as these definitions will impact people on the spectrum, as there are many disabled individuals who qualify for Medicaid for reasons other than social security disability. This will place many people on the spectrum who appear to be high functioning, but may have additional supports and needs within, it, within the gray zone. Those in this gray zone will be negatively impacted by work requirements to the point of having to declare themselves permanently disabled to receive health coverage. Once an individual declares this status, they can no longer work, and it makes them pretty much eligible for every entitlement under the sun. I would encourage you to ask yourselves, is this dignity? I think it's worth noting that I fall in this great category. While part-time work has historically been beneficial for me, finding the right job was always difficult. We need to encourage voluntary employment that meets individual needs, not one size fits all work requirements. I firmly believe in the principle, nothing about us without us, as a, as a disability rights activist. Medicaid work requirements don't improve the lives of people with disabilities who are on the Medicaid expansion, so naturally I oppose them. Further, furthermore, the small section of the po population that this legislation targets will merely get sick and go to the ER. One year later, they'll get sick again, they'll go back to the ER, and the cycle will start over. If an individual enrolls in Medicaid, then fails to meet the work requirements, and then shows up sick in the ER, are they going to deny him medical care? I can say with 99% 99 certainty they won't. In conclusion, this bill does not deter dependency, it enhances it. I would, members to, I would encourage members to vote against this legislation, which is counterproductive and economically harmful to the disability and mental health communities, medical providers, local government, and most of all, the taxpayers. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Leff, and then Commissioner Higgins, followed by Melissa Huberty and Keith Carlson. Welcome. Thank you. My name is Senta Leff. I'm the Executive Director of the Minnesota Coalition for the Homeless. Among the three most common reasons for Minnesotans experiencing homelessness are chronic health conditions. 60% of homeless adults report a significant mental illness. So imagine hearing voices in your head and hallucinating on the street while navigating the complex and bureaucratic work requirements imposed by this bill. These adults have a median income of just over $6,000 a year. They already face incredible barriers to obtaining and maintaining their health care, which means they haven't been labeled as disabled. Other health issues most commonly experienced by homeless Minnesotans include substance abuse disorders and traumatic brain injuries, all of which are difficult to diagnose and may never qualify them as being disabled. Last night, two Republican House members voted against this bill. Representative Zerwas referred to the one in five Minnesotans who access medical assistance. He acknowledged the growth in our HHS spending, and then he quickly and strongly made clear that this bill is not the approach to fixing our health care problems. I quote, understand the faith we have to put in the Department of Human Services and 87 different counties across the state to accurately identify whether or not someone meets the work and health qualifications every 30 days under this bill. He reminded us that Minnesota is millions of dollars over budget just to build a website, yet we expect the same bureaucracy to ferret out these costly and complex requirements week after week for about $15 million and with 65 employees. Representative Hamilton also voted against this bill last night. He said it isn't Medicaid recipients who are destroying health care, it's sick people being denied coverage. Representative Hamilton reminded us all how easy it is to see health care as a privilege when we are healthy. Please do what Representative Zerwas and Hamilton did last night. Vote no on costly barriers to medical assistance. Vote no on complex bureaucratic regulations with unintended consequences for our most vulnerable community members. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome, Commissioner Higgins, then Ms. Huberty and Mr. Carlson. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have a letter here from the Association of Minnesota Counties for you all as well. Thank you. Uh, I'm Hennepin County Commissioner Linda Higgins, and I chair the Health and Human Services Policy Committee for Association of Minnesota Counties. Uh, I'm here to testify on the impact of work requirements on counties and the people we serve. In Hennepin County, 
244,879 people are enrolled in medical assistance. At any given time, about 55,000 would be part of the population subject to working, work requirements. Our data show that about half of the targeted population is already working. 41% have a diagnosed mental illness, and 27% have substance use disorder, both of which present barriers to stable employment. 34% had previous involvement in the criminal justice system, also a serious barrier to employment. 8% were are um, adults with co-occurring behavioral health conditions and elevated involvement across healthcare, housing, and criminal justice. As you can imagine, for this unique and vulnerable population, sustaining employment is difficult. However, we know firsthand the important role that work plays in the lives and recovery of the people we serve. In partnership with Twin Cities Rise, for example, uh, employment <coughs> counselors are part of a clinical care teams for medical assistance <coughs> enrollees experiencing mental illness and substance use disorder. By pairing employment services with medical assistance, we have seen individuals empowered to re-enter the workforce, having the supports around them to remain working. And we have observed reduced costs in their health care when they are employed. Such success would not be possible without medical assistance providing medications and the treatment necessary to make work a realistic option. Losing Medicare does not cure an illness or make a disability less of a challenge. It's the opposite. If people fail to report hours correctly or if they lose a job and then lose Medicaid, they will return to crisis health care, resulting in increased costs and uncompensated care. As you heard, HCMC estimates potential losses of eight to $15 million, losses that will have to be absorbed by our county property taxpayers. From a statewide county perspective, this isn't a partisan issue. Whether or not a commissioner agrees with the need for work requirements, across the state, commissioners share the concern about the additional administrative burden that will be placed on the shoulders of our county staff. We will need more staff to verify people are working. We will need more staff to ensure people are in compliance with monthly reporting requirements. Monthly reporting requirements. In Hennepin County, we estimate we will require additional 250 full-time equivalents. That's at a cost to our county after a federal reimbursement of $14.7 million <laughs> paid by property taxes. We will also be completing employment verifications using old technology that functions poorly. Or maybe it will need an entirely new system that will take years to develop, field test, and properly function. Can anyone say METS and MINLARS? Oh boy. The bottom line for counties is that this legislation will raise county costs and force us to raise property taxes. In all 87 counties, the effect on county staff county budgets and county property taxpayers will be significant. We cannot support this bill. It's an unfunded mandate that will not improve the health and well-being of your constituents, our constituents, the people who we jointly serve who are on medical assistance. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Higgins. You. And uh, members, we are well over the 20 minutes allotted for the op opposing side. The remaining testifiers are all people well known um, to the committee and so I'm going to ask, uh, we're going to have two more testifiers, uh, Mr. Carlson and then the remaining have uh, submitted their testimony then we're going to go to member questions. So um, thank you, Ms. Madam Hubert. Chair. Good afternoon, Madam, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, we, we have rooms. Most, you know, most of the committees are done. We didn't we're not doing justice if we don't hear from the people affected by this. This is, this is transformational change. This is not a little deal. This is going to change. People are going to die if we do this. It's our job to listen. And Senator Loria, do you want to give members time to? I would like time to ask questions too, but I'd also like to listen to the public. It is not too much to ask. To, to give them the time that they need to tell us their stories. Senator Laurie, we, we believe 
I believe that we have been fair and have given a lot of time and um, we're going to try to wrap up. We're hearing from the counties, which are a unique group that we haven't heard from their perspective, and then we're going to move on to member comments. So Ms. Huberty, please proceed. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the committee. My name is Melissa Huberty, and I'm the Human Services Administrator in Stearns County. And I'm, be, um, I'm here on behalf of the Association of Minnesota Counties and the Minnesota Association of County Social Services Administrators. And on behalf of 87 counties, I want to reiterate that this is not a partisan issue. This is a practical issue. In Stearns County, we will alone, just in, in our little county, we will have to add at least six FTEs, six staff that I will be putting towards simply monitoring paperwork and entering data. That is what the staff is gonna do with this bill. And it is not going to help people towards self-sufficiency. And my rural counterparts talk about that they will have to add at least 10 to 15 staff. You heard some of the metro counties having to add over 200 and some of like-sized counties adding up to 40 staff just to monitor paperwork and um, add um, and to enter data. And so I'd like to reiterate that the biggest issue is simple logistics and that um, of how workers would accomplish this in the counties. Either we're gonna have to use our current technology and you guys already know that um, we do not need another METS or MINLAR situation, which takes years for counties to have to get to the point where it's fully functional for us. But the bottom line is it's gonna raise county taxes and um, forces our boards to either make cuts in other areas or increase the property excuse me, increase the property taxes. And if the legislature is really going to ask counties to pick and choose between all that, we're asking that you very carefully consider the unintended consequences of this bill, because there are many. Thank you for the opportunity to testify Thank today. you, Mr. Carlson. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, Keith Carlson, I'm Executive Director of the Minnesota Intercounty Association that consists of four suburban counties and 10 greater Minnesota regional center counties. Uh, I do want to indicate that our board has not taken a position for or against this bill. Uh, and I suspect that were the question to be placed to our 14-member county representatives that consist of two commissioners for each of those counties in isolation, whether they support work requirements, majority would probably say yes. But unfortunately, this bill is not administered in isolation. In practical terms, it will take substantial county staff, uh, and this will add to the substantial costs that we already incur uh, to administer what are largely state programs. Uh, counties currently spend over three quarters of a billion dollars to administer the states. I, I emphasize the states, income maintenance programs and healthcare programs and social services, much of which are mandated by the state in the areas of child protection, child support enforcement, um, services to the developmentally disabled, mentally ill and chemically dependent. Um, our county taxpayers, uh, your constituents, pay these dollars to administer these programs. Uh, to give you some sort of dimension uh, on what this will cost counties, uh, based on the fiscal note that just became available yesterday, I estimate that in the initial year this will cost counties at least $50 million to administer. By the time we winnow it down to those individuals who uh, are will be subject to the work requirements on a current recurring basis, it will cost us at least $30 million. With that, I'll conclude. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you. Okay, members. Madam Chair, um, I, I just got to note that there's uh, two uh, mothers in the audience, uh, Gail Weidenbach from uh, Kalawa, Minnesota, and a Misty Little Wolf uh, from Lake George. <laughs> They, they drove four and a half hours to come and testify. They didn't get a chance to sign up on the thing. Um, uh, you know, and at least uh, Sarah Campbell, you know, the uh, minister from United Church of Christ um, has been on the, on the list. I, I would like to open it up at least to those three. Um, She's been waiting Senator for Lurie, over I'll, two hours. The two private citizens who did drive, I will take their testimony. Um, could you repeat their names? Uh, I got the names Gail Weidenbach and Misty Littlewolf. Ms. Weidenbach and Ms. Littlewolf, if you could please join us at the table. Hi, my name is Gail Weidenbach and I live in Callaway, Minnesota. 
And I'd like to tell you a little bit about how this would affect my family. My family is currently on Medicaid. We have eight children. My husband and I have been together for 20 years. My husband has two college degrees and he works extremely hard to support his family. However, he does work for a manufacturing company and he could lose his job tomorrow. He is on salary and again, he works very hard, but losing his job tomorrow would be devastating our family. Taking away our health care would mean that I wouldn't get the antibiotic therapy that I would need to keep me off the couch with my, debil my debilitating nerve condition. There is a small possibility that if my husband would to lose his job and he wasn't able to find another one, even with his two college degrees, my chances of going back to work because of that nerve condition, pulling our health care away, would give me no chance of that. So now my husband would have to not only be mom and dad because I wouldn't be physically able to care for our children, but he'd have to try to find another job. Then our housing would be compromised and you have eight children whose lives have been completely turned upside down. I ask you very deeply to take into consideration this bill and please vote no because it would really impact people. They are good, hardworking people and this bill, it's, again, there's good, hardworking people and unforeseen life circumstances happen to really good, hardworking people. And when those things happen, pulling their health care away is only going to cost an even larger spiral hurricane effect downward. Not good for anyone. Please vote no on this bill. Thank you. Thank you. And Ms. Little Wolf. I'm a mother of five and I'm on medical assistance and this bill would affect me and my children because I'm going to be married in about five months and that would also it would affect me and my children greatly and i just please thank you and to thank you for your testimony and to members questions <coughs> senator marty madam chair um, we've heard a lot of testimony today and senator johnson when you were explaining the your intent behind the bill, you said you wanted to make sure we provide for care for people who, I think you used the word, and you emphasized the word, truly need medical care. And you told us the story of some classmate or somebody who used to get medical assistance and is doing very well. I, I think the stories we've heard today, everyone's different. Everybody has different needs. And I wonder what somebody who doesn't truly need medical care means. Um, who are we ruling out? People who sort of might need medical care and who makes that decision? Because I guess that's what my concern is. This is, I've been here 31 years and I've never seen us try and take away medical assistance. We had one time a governor who unallotted or something, people who would now be in this population. And he said it would save $300 million. And of course, HCMC alone said they'd have 100 million more care. And I thought it would save money if the 35,000 of the poorest and sickest people in the state would cooperate and stop getting sick. But do you think any of these folks who came here today who are on medical assistance that you take it away that they will not be sick anymore? Or how do you view that? Well, who do you mean by not truly medically needy? Senator Madam Johnson. Chair. Senator Marty, I appreciate the, con the, the question. This bill is really getting after uh, the medically, uh, those are able-bodied without dependents. Um, you know, a lot of the, the testifiers that we that talked today, I think, um, you know, there's some concerns, and, and that's on me, that the, the concerns uh, that a lot of these folks feel, especially, you know, we saw here at the end, um, a couple of folks that drove all the way down from up north in my neck of the woods, uh, to testify, and the the thing with this bill is that we're trying to protect those sorts of people that truly need it. And you see uh, the exceptions that we have here, and one of those exceptions is uh, you know children, children up to the age of 18. They're not they're not being removed. Uh, those who are currently working. We've heard a lot about uh, the program currently. 60% uh, of those on MA are, are working. They have. They have nothing to, uh, to worry about on, on this. Uh, those with substance abuse. We heard several testimonies, or a couple of testimonies today about substance abuse issues and those who might be uh, in jeopardy for that. that. That's not something in jeopardy. We want to protect those people 
that truly need those, uh, those, the medical assistance. And I'm very, I very much want to protect those people. And we've carved that out. So those that are left are those that are able-bodied without dependents. Madam Chair. Senator Marty. Uh, um, I'm just looking at my list of testifiers and there were two in a row, Mr. Kerr and Mr. Riley, one of whom said he was not disabled, he's able to work, but he said that was some days, not other days. And I know a lot of people who are in that shape where they can work sometimes and not other times. And what's he supposed to do? Is he not supposed to qualify? Or is he supposed to qualify one month and then not the next month? Or Sure. Uh, Senator Johnson. Madam Chair, Senator Marty. Uh, again, if you look at 3.3, .3, uh, there, there are the medically frail. Uh, I think that that could definitely cover a situation in which somebody is frail and maybe one week they'll be able to work and the next week they can't. Uh, otherwise, there is on 4.19, uh, the good cause exception, where the commissioner has the ability to make exceptions for individuals that might fall into that category. Uh, there's also, I should go back, um, there's also uh, 3.4 that termination of physically or mentally unfit for employment. There are those exceptions, but we're trying to get at those individuals that might be on the edge, and we can still be able to give them those exemptions until they're able to, to get, uh, you know, if they're able to get back on their feet and more stable, then of course they will be, uh, be asked to participate in the workforce. But if they're not, you know, there's a number of exceptions in here, exemptions that we'll, we'll, we'll cover. Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Marty. Senator Johnson, I, I see medically frail based on criteria established by the commissioner. First of all, commissioner, a good person, and um, I think we'll do well with this, but then you have 87 counties who are hiring new people for this, and they're gonna have to decide if these people fit into that criteria. I think a lot of us think that Everybody ought to have health care, like everybody ought to have an education. And I don't like the idea that the commissioner determines if I'm qualified to get health care or not. I just think that's a terrible idea to leave it to the county or the, because the county is going to be implementing the state standard and that they're the ones determining, do I or, or Mr. Kerr or Mr. Riley, do they qualify for health care? I, I don't see why that's an appropriate thing. And, and you're saying, well, they would both qualify as being mentally, medically frail or something else. I guess I don't know why we want some government official to be determining you qualify for health care and you don't. I mean, your classmate, your friend who is doing very well now, I, I, I'm glad that 30 years ago, that 20 years ago, that that classmate wasn't put up to the same thing where some county official decides if they get health care or not. Madam Chair. Senator Johnson. Senator Marty, I appreciate that. But currently, MA is administered by the government. The government is determining who fits in that criteria and who doesn't. So no matter if we're drawing these lines this way or that way, it's gonna be a government official that's determining that line. Ma Madam you, Chair. Senator Marty. Senator Johnson, in 30 years, I haven't seen us cut back on who gets this and is one who thinks everybody deserves health care and I don't think government should be deciding well, you can't get medical assistance or somebody else. I think everybody ought to have health care. I don't want to have kindergartners who decide that someday education is expensive like health care and well we'll decide which kindergartners deserve to go to school. I, I don't think that should be a thing government does and, and you're saying well we already don't allow everybody into it so let's take away more. It's okay if government makes that decision. I just think, as I said, this is only time in 30 years I've seen us talking about legislation to take people off of health care. Okay, thank you. Senator Hayden. Well, thank you, um, Madam Chair and um, Senator Johnson. Um, I just have a couple of questions. So Senator Johnson, you're uh, pretty new around here. How did you get this bill? Who gave it to you, or how did you come up with it? Senator Johnson. Madam Chair, this was a bill that uh, we had with, within the HHS community. I talked to uh, Michelle, uh, Senator Benson, about uh, this particular uh, bill that I knew was, was available. So that's how I got it. So thank you, uh, Madam Chair. So 
Senator Johnson, I've been a member of this HHS community for about 10 years here in the legislature, and many people around this table uh, have been here. I've served with Senator Abler even in the House. Um, so I didn't know, you know, I'm just getting to know you and didn't know your kind of, you know, expertise. Um, so um, it appears that you, Somebody talked to you, and then you talked to the to the chair, and you got the bill. Okay, um, I, I guess Hayden, I got that. If I could just for a moment, um, I had been looking at waivers that other states had requested, and I wanted a hardworking freshman who was willing to carry hard legislation, and so I asked a few people, and so it, you sort of implied that somebody else did this, and I. I appreciate that, Senator Hayden, but I just wanted to be clear. Thank you. Oh, okay. So, so Senator, so, so Miss, Madam Chair, you, this is your bill. This is your idea for a bill that you just gave it to Senator Johnson to carry. Senator Hayden, I asked if somebody wanted to work on this um, as we were looking at what other states were doing. Okay. No, that's, that's fine. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate that as a freshman around here. I've carried plenty of bills that the chairs have given me as well. So I just was trying to figure out kind of your interest uh, in it. Um, Senator Johnson, you familiar with the 1132 waiver that we got to apply for with the federal government? Madam Chair. Senator Johnson. I don't know the intimate details of 11, uh, of that waiver, 1115, but it's one that both uh, Kentucky, Indiana, Arkansas have applied for and received and created legislation to implement those. So, well, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Thank right. you, uh, uh, Senator Johnson. The only reason why I said it is that, you know, these are very complex issues and even for old veterans like me, they're very hard to understand. I know one of the testifiers said that it must be budget neutral um, in order to, for them to even consider it. And so, uh, Senator Johnson, one of the things that we would have to do is to cut people. There's an assumption that people would be cut from the program. Are you aware of that and comfortable with that? Senator Johnson. Madam Chair. Uh, I was just looking here at the medical assistance program chart from uh, that, that we have published here. I was looking back in 2010, prior to the expansion, 608,000 individuals were eligible for medical assistance then. I was looking over to 2017, um, and these are numbers I'm sure, being so you're on the HHS and you've you've seen those, Senator Hayden, that uh, it nearly doubled to 1,082,000 and change. The expansion over the last few years has been astronomical, especially when you take from 1981 up till 2010, it only increased threefold. I think with that expansion, something needs to be done. Now, I'm not saying that we're gonna take people off and we need to cut them, I'm just saying we need to take a look at who's going on there. And that's what this legislation does. And we wanna make sure that we are protecting those who truly need this. So, Senator Johnson, Madam Senator. Chair, Senator Johnson, just a couple more questions. So, I think that you kinda of said two things. You first off showed how many more people got on medical assistance. Those are good numbers, mm -hmm. I agree, that was the intent. That's, that's why we did it, right? Um, but then at the same time, on the, the end of your comment, you said, but it's not your intention to necessarily kick people off. And in your opening statement, you said you really wanted people to get to work. But the reality is, is that we're gonna kick people off. And I think that, and I don't, re, and, and I don't, wanna, I don't want to, to put words in your mouth, but, but that's what you said was, we, we've had an expansion. So I infer that we need to pull uh, those things back. But, but Senator Johnson, Madam Chair, um, uh, just a couple of, of things, and we'll probably have a few more comments later. We, we talked about children, and, and a lot of folks came up and talked about their children uh -huh. and kids, and, and uh, sincerely, uh, Senator Johnson, I really do think you're a good person and a very nice guy, um, but kids lose their coverage when their parents do. As a matter of fact, there's data out there that says that between 13 and 20% of kids are the enrollment of kids in medical assistance goes down when their parents lose this coverage. So I wanna make sure, cause we've been sitting around here for years listening to this and studying this. So maybe an unintended consequence 
uh, maybe that you know or maybe that you don't know, is that when, you, when the parents lose enrollment, the children lose enrollment. Mm -hmm. So we're going to hurt kids. Um, and I know that that's not the intent of this bill, but that's essentially what it would be. And, and that, you know, uh, Senator Johnson, Madam Chair, um, I, I want to let some of my colleagues uh, get in this, but I think it's clear by listening to the counties and the folks that have to administer this, people in your uh, neck of the woods, if you will, but certainly those right here in the metro area that have the bulk of the folks here, it's going to cost a tremendous amount of money in order to do it. My background over time, many of these people that came to testify today, I've worked with directly, not just in the legislature. I've served with them. I've walked those streets with the folks that unfortunately don't have a place to live. Um, and I've also administered these benefits to people. And it takes a lot of energy to be able to try to keep the rules that we have today and to put that burden on counties, which are overwhelmed today, um, I think that it is actually doing the opposite of what you want. I think it's going to cost more money. I think we're going to harm more people. I think we're going to send people spiraling uh, into health care crises. I think our ERs are going to be overrun. I I'm kind of getting into my closing speech, but Senator Johnson, I, I just want you to kind of know that and don't take those things lightly as you start to really study the ramifications of what you're doing. And, and I've often had bills that, that people have given me and maybe I didn't quite understand them. And I think you're starting to really understand what's going to happen here if we were to move this forward. Thank you, Senator Laurie and then Senator Eaton. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. You know, as to the issue about the growth in medical assistance, I, I think it bears mentioning as well, you know, we've always had programs for these people. The Affordable Care Act came online, and yes, we moved a lot of people to, Minnesota, uh, to medical assistance, mm -hmm. but we had Minnesota Care that went to 275% of federal poverty level, not 138%. Minnesota has been a generous state. Um, and it's something that we've always been proud of. We had general assistance medical care as well um, that covered a, a lot of the people that, that we saw today. And I'm wondering if this is all about um, workforce, uh, Senator Johnson, uh, do you know where Minnesota stands in workforce participation uh, in, in the country? Senator Johnson. Madam Chair, Senator Lori, appreciate the, con the comments. Uh, well, there's a couple things there. I know that, that presently we have more job openings in this state than we do workers. And one of the testifiers today from DEED, I believe it was, said that this would almost double the number of people driven to their workforce uh, programs. I mean, if, we're, if we can double the number of people that we're training, finding jobs for in this state, this is an incredible benefit for those uh, people who are who are on the margin right now that are able-bodied without dependents. Uh, and Chair, to I, Senator Larry. I think the Assistant Commissioner from Deed said a very different thing about his conclusion. It would drive, um, you know, as many as, the, as are there today in again, but just to work on paperwork, not to actually s seek jobs, to work on the paperwork that's required in your belt. And it would displace those that are actually seeking jobs through their uh, employment services. That's what he said. It's going to move us backwards in our ability to get people into jobs. Um, and so, yes, you, you know, you had a couple of facts that he stated, but I asked about Minnesota's work participation Senator and Johnson. what is. I, I would just like oh, to. I was still speaking, but. I would just like to correct the because I do have it written down when he said that employment services would double. That's what I have in quotes here, but. Continue. Uh, Continue. Madam Chair, Senator yes. Murray. He said that, that they would have twice as many people coming to them. But I guess what you missed and didn't write down is that those extra people coming to them would be coming to them to fill in the paperwork, to prove that they're seeking jobs, to prove that they're doing the work that you're requiring, the, the, mm -hmm. the efforts that you're requiring, not actually even having the the capabilities to work yet. They're working on their health, too. We heard that very clearly from the testifiers. They're working on their health. You need health in order to work. And so my question about Minnesota's work participation rate, Minnesota does work. Minnesota works well. We have the second highest work participation rate in the entire country. 
We have between 80 and 90 percent of all Minnesotans between the ages of 18 and 60 in the labor market. You said in your opening statements that you wanted to follow the lead of Arkansas and Kentucky. Arkansas and Kentucky are in the 50 percentiles. They're in the 50s. Their people don't work. Minnesotans work because we invest in their health. Our investments in the health of Minnesotans, our people and our communities, pays tremendous dividends to our economy and to our businesses around the state. We shouldn't be following the lead of Kentucky and Arkansas. Arkansas and Kentucky should be following the lead of Minnesota. We have the second highest work participation rate in the entire country, something that we should be proud of, not turning our backs on. And, you know, if I, I'd like to get members to step through the fiscal note a little bit here. You know, we are a finance committee. Um, on page 11, this is going to get, you know, a little hard in the, in the MA adults without children category. You know, so that's up in the upper left here. You can see that's the area that we're in. You can come down to the, to the bottom, the federal share line, and this is uh, calendar, this is fiscal 2021, which is not fully um, implemented yet. I mean, I should say there's still more work to be done. But in order to save, you know, I'm putting it in, in air quotes here, save $12 million of state money that's invested in the health of our people and our populations, we're giving up on $113, $114 million of federal money. Now that money is actually used to buy services, to buy services from our health care uh, community all across the state. We're giving up, in order to save $12 million, we're giving up $114 million of federal revenue that comes in to support our health care industry. That's why the hospital association and the MMA and the mental health and the chemical dependency groups stand in unison, in strong <coughs> opposition to what you're proposing to do. If you turn to page 13, this is, this is in the MA disabled category. And you know, there's two effects here. First, you know, um, a lot of the people, when we did the Medicaid expansion, a lot of people who used to have to come through the disability door in order to gain health care through special needs basic care, um, uh, because of the expanded uh, income limits and the removal of the asset tests, over 20,000 people were able to come through the regular door for medical assistance. That was a good thing. That was an amazing thing for people's lives. 20,000 people living with disabilities could be treated with the dignity of having access to the care that they needed every day. And uh, just over 3,000 of them, again in, in 2021, are going to have to turn away from that and go back through the special needs basic care. Now, the interesting interaction with this is that when they turn away from the <coughs> Medicaid expansion, Medicaid expansion population <coughs> is paid at 90% federal. So we're saving 10 cents on the dollar. We're moving these people into a program that doesn't work as well for them, that we get paid 50 cents on the dollar in, and the special needs basic care rates are 65% higher. That's why this disability piece is so incredibly expensive in the proposal that you have before us. It's not a good idea to do this, and it harms people's lives. And, you know, you said also that, that you worked with a lot of stakeholders who helped you, you know, who contributed to helping put this bill in the shape it was today, that it is today. And, and I'm just, it, it struck me because you only had one testifier in support of this bill and we did ask if he'd stick around. I think he left and I haven't seen him since. Um, and I'm just curious as to the stakeholders that you worked with. Did you, did you, have you contacted the hospitals in your region? 
Senator Johnson. Senator Johnson. Senator Benson, we've had communications with the with the hospitals in the area. One of the things I do want to say is that uh, my test fire, uh, Jason, he couldn't stay. There was a family event that came up, uh, so he will not be able to stay. But he said he's available for questions at any time, Senator Laurie. So please, uh, please forgive him for taking off. The other thing that. Uh, was very important today was to minimize the number of people that were speaking uh, for this bill in an effort to see what the true concerns were on this particular piece of legislation. We can get praises all day long if we want. We can make telephone calls. I've gotten a lot of support from this, uh, from my community, from all around the state. But we really want to know what are the problems with this bill. And I was so thankful that we were able to spend that extra time with those individuals to hear what the issues are. And hopefully, uh, you know, most of those issues I believe that we've addressed within the legislation, but there are a few uh, things that, you know, maybe we've got questions on. Maybe the commissioner, when they're doing their guideline, will be able to help to guide those guidelines into a way that will be more compassionate to individuals that feel that way. Thank you. Um, Senator Lori, I do have Senator Eaton and Senator Jensen. Do you have further I, I, I do have further questions. I mean, we can come back to me if you'd prefer. Um, we can if you want to, I'll cycle through and I'll put you. Put me back on. Thank you, I'll... Senator Lori. Senator Eaton. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm nowhere near as knowledgeable on this as um, Senator Lori. I come from this more from, um, I believe health care is a right, not a privilege. I believe that everyone should have the right to have their health um, to have preventative care, to um, have care when they're ill, and um, I believe it's a matter of dignity, and I, help, I think it helps a lot with the disparities in our community. Um, I would rather use the, um, what was it, $14.7 million in property taxes that Commissioner Higgins talked about to hire people to, for more bureaucrats to, um, help the health care of the people in my community who are in poverty or um, people of color in particular who are facing uh, incredible odds in a lot of areas that are disparate, um, then, like I said, then pay for more bureaucrats. Um, the fact that we spent hundreds of millions of dollars for people with 400% of poverty to make sure that their um, policies weren't too expensive but yet we want to throw people in poverty off of their insurance is just, um, I just think this bill is just plain mean. I guess that's, I, the fiscal savings aren't there and that seems to be the point of the bill um, and it doesn't improve individual health care and um, it basically says some people aren't worthy of their health of having good health care. The uncompensated care of 7.9 to 15 million at HCMC alone that this is gonna cost. I mean, I can't think of anything worse to do than this bill. I'm sorry, uh, Senator Johnson, but this, this, is, uh, this has me baffled that you would wanna support something like this. Thank you, Madam Senator Chair. Jensen. Oh. I'm sorry, Senator Johnson. I, I'm uh, Senator Eaton, I, I am sorry that you feel that this is mean legislation. I, I don't think that could be anywhere from the truth. This legislation gives the agency of a person's life back to them. This allows them to find a job, find dignity for an able-bodied working person. I never said anything in my opening statement or otherwise that this was a cost-saving bill. What this is, is we're investing in individuals, trying to get them work, trying to get them the medical need that they, the, the services they need. Uh, this is not a cost saving bill. We're investing in, in individuals and that's the purpose of this bill. Okay, thank you, Senator, okay, briefly Senator Eaton and then Senator Jensen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Senator, um, I'm, I, I don't understand how you can think we're investing in people when essentially what you're doing is threatening their health care. If um, if they don't somehow find a way to work with whatever their issues are. A lot of them aren't obvious. A lot of them don't fit into a nice little form. People who want to work in Minnesota work. We have, we have a work ethic here, as uh, mm -hmm. Senator uh, Lori pointed out. Um, anybody I know who isn't working and on medical assistance 
um, has gone through hell and back. I'm a, I'm a registered nurse. I worked in the community and with many of the people that um, that uh, uh, Senator Hayden talked about. In fact, at one time in the same organization and um, on an ACT team. And these people didn't not work because they didn't want to. It wasn't that they didn't have access. Many of them went to workforce centers day after day, year after year. But their health or their mental health or their um, uh, post-traumatic stress, whatever you want to talk about it, prevented them from ever actually being able to get a job or their, the fact that they had a felony or some criminal thing on their record wouldn't let them in law, wouldn't, no employer would hire them. So I don't see that this bill accomplishes anything. Thank you, Senator Jensen. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Senator Johnson, for bringing this uh, this bill before us. Uh, I can't help but think back to the phrase, don't kill the messenger. I thought it was appropriate that Senator Hayden asked about how you ended up with this bill because this is a huge conversation. This is, this is far bigger than a work for MA bill. This is bigger than MinCare buy-in. This is bigger than Medicare for all. This is a transformative discussion that we need to have all over our country. We see it happening in Kentucky and Indiana, and now we're having the conversation here in Minnesota. And before I get my final remarks done, I'd just like to go with some specifics. About two hours ago, three hours ago, um, Dr. John Pryor, who runs Hennepin County, called me and said, Scott, we've run all the numbers. And he said, when we run the numbers here, we're going to have 32,000 of our patients displaced, and we'll not be able to access back in based on the exclusions. 32,000 people in one fell swoop. That's more, than, more people than in all of Polk County. Bang. So that's tough. I think we're trapped a little bit by the word able-bodied. When I think of able-bodied and did some research on it, I think of having a sound, strong body. Some synonyms are bouncing, fit, whole, uh, robust, sound. We're not talking about the people that are going to be displaced here. I can't trust the commissioner and that's prominent in this bill. When my brother was sick, I remember um, he had his demons in his head. And our family, you know, we tried to sort of get him in line. We tried to give him a chance to sort of get back into the mainstream of life in Minnesota. And I remember my dad trying very hard. And we did many things. Uh, dad would say, well, if you did this, you know, we'll do this. And if you did th But we never trifled with this health care. We, we couldn't because that would be putting his life at risk. I really do thank you for bringing this before us because you've shown remarkable courage and I don't know if I could have held up as well as you did. When we expanded medical assistance in 2014 to 138%, we have to remember what that represents. That repre represents an individual making $16,000 a year. That's $8 an hour. That's $8 an hour. I don't know how anybody could make it on $8 an hour. I mean. I think we need to look at this issue through a bigger lens. Frankly, I, I cannot vote for this bill. But I don't think this bill should be a partisan issue. I think this is about more than Republicans and Democrats. I think the whole Senate body as a whole should weigh in on this. Everybody should put their mark by their light. What are we going to do with this? This is a huge issue. I think Senator Lori had it right. This is transformative. This is absolutely transformative. Senator Eaton said she thinks health care is a right. Someone might say it's a privilege. I don't think we can answer that today before this committee. So what I would say is thank you for bringing it before us. I certainly don't think it has a shape that I would be proud to say, but I think it's not, a, it's not meant to be a destination. It's meant to be part of the journey. It's a step along the way, and I thank you for bringing it to us. So on this bill, I will abstain. And Senator you, Laurie asked for your closing comments. Well, actually, I, you know, I've got the A6 amendment. I mean, we're going to take amendments too, right? I mean, we're still I'm sorry, committee, Senator right? Laurie wasn't aware that you had an amendment, so we will take amendments. I, Madam Chair, I move the A6 amendment.
Chair, when, whenever you're ready. Uh, Senator Lori, I'm trying to orient this. You're bringing in the Legislative Coordinating Commission and... I'm bringing in legislators. Oh, the legislators? Yes, Madam Chair. Oh, that we have to submit a form. Madam Chair, I'll explain my Please amendment. Please walk through the it, amendment. And it, it's part of what we heard from the counties, too. The counties are going to be incredibly put upon. I think that uh, Keith Carlson's $50 million was likely pretty modest in terms of what the counties are going to be faced with. Um, you know, in fact, you know, the Kentucky estimates, uh, we can probably see much more closely what the full-born cost is because they don't have a county-administered system. And their system came in at over $185 million uh, per year to administer. That's when they're doing the work that we're pushing off on counties. And since legislators aren't here for, you know, seven months out of the year, sometimes eight, I thought, you know, we're maybe a, a decent workforce to go and help the counties. We're going to go into the counties. We're going to get trained on how we take a look at these people's lives and make decisions about these people's lives. These people who came and talked to us today. And we're going to make those life and, and death decisions about whether they're going to get access to health care. And of course, it's not about our salary or anything, but if, you know, if, if some of us don't have the 10 hours per, per week to go in and help the counties make these determinations, then we're going to lose our health care. But not to worry, because if we, if we go in the next month then and, and put in our 10 hours every week in that next month, then we can be reinstated on our health care. You know, after a little bit of a lockout period. And I'm trying to be very compassionate here and make sure that we're not overburdening us. But I think that each and every one of us would learn one heck of a lot if we went and spent more time with the people who came before us today and actually sat down across the table from them and worked on this paperwork with them. And so it might seem like I'm being a little tongue in cheek here. I'm not. I think this would be a tremendous addition to Senate File 3611 if it actually caused legislators to go and engage with the people across the communities of Minnesota who struggle. And Senator Jensen, I ask you for your support in the A6 Amendment. Senator Johnson. Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Senator Lori, for the suggestion. I think that, that this is lagging then. We've got uh, other departments of the, of the Minnesota state government. Uh, we know that Minute could use some. Uh, we could go over there and, and look at them. We could go to the DOT or DEED or any other department and spend time there too. And I think that's, as legislators, our responsibility to get uh, into those facilities and understand what is going on, but to mandate it. Uh, through this this uh, amendment, I don't think it's the intent of my bill, uh, but I do encourage you and and others who uh, haven't spent time. I know I need to spend more time in our community, uh, in our county, uh, uh, talking about this, uh, and I and I plan to do more and more of it. But uh, this is something as an elected official. Uh, that, that uh, we should be understanding our counties and how they function anyways. So uh, I am opposed to this uh, particular amendment, uh, Madam Chair. Members, Senator Lurie. I ask for members' support. I mean, I, I wish you had gone and spent more time at the counties working with some of these people ahead of bringing this bill, to tell you the truth. Um, I, you know, I ask for member support on the A6 okay. Amendment. To the A6 Amendment, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed? No. no. The amendment is not adopted. Senator, any further amendments? Um, Senator Hayden? Division, please. Oh, division. A division has been requested. All those in favor of the A6 Amendment, please raise your right hand. And those opposed? 
the decision of the chair is supported. The A6 amendment is not adopted. Further amendments? Any further amendments, Senator Hayden? Do you have an amendment? I don't have an amendment, but I have a statement. Okay, so we are to final comments then. Senator Hayden and then Senator Lurie as ranking member on this committee. I would appreciate your final comments. Senator Hayden, So thank comments. you, um, Madam Chair um, and Senator Johnson. I, I really do think that this has been a, a real good exercise for us to kind of walk through in, in a really good way, as Senator Jensen said, to, to start thinking about this uh, broader issue and hopefully, um, um, you know, hopefully we've all gotten a lot. But I just want to leave you with a, a little story that uh, happened in my life uh, not too long ago, maybe, I think just about a year ago, as a matter of fact, it was the, uh, uh, around Easter time, my wife uh, got a call from her mother, uh, who's Senator Abler's constituent, um, and uh, she said her sister was sick and that the hospital called, she lived in Omaha, Nebraska, and that she was in the hospital in the ICU and they needed to come. So in the middle of the night, my wife got up, jumped in the car, rode to Anoka, picked up my wife and got to Omaha, Nebraska. And when they got there, they found that their sister, her sister uh, and daughter was uh, critically ill. Um, she had run into a car and after they had kind of figured it out, they found out that she had uh, serious internal uh, damage to her liver and her kidneys and her system was shutting down due to alcoholism. She had essentially uh, drank herself to that point. Now, my sister worked in law, sister, worked up until the day until she bumped into that car when she passed out. So when they took her to the hospital, at that time, her, as her system was failing and she was going into withdrawal, they gave us the news that they didn't think without a liver transplant, that she would live um, and that being, but it took six months to get on any list to get the liver transplant and the doctors didn't think that she would live that long. So we dealt with this issue, we figured out what was going on, so we thought we were going to bring my dear sister Michelle home, that if she was going to pass away, she was gonna die with dignity with us. So we went and we got her and we brought her home, and she applied for medical assistance. And she was able to get medical assistance, and we worked awfully, uh, awfully hard with some of the greatest doctors. Uh, I know the line of folks are here, they were great at Unity and Mercy, I think, where she ended up finally passing away. But they worked diligently to try to get her to hold on, get her through in order for her life to be prolonged. She, in the, she started going to AA. As a matter of fact, she got a medallion of being sober for six weeks. We were ecstatic about that. But mind you, my sister-in-law was never disabled. She was an abled body person who worked up until the last few months of her life. So Senator Johnson, I want you to reflect, and members of this committee to reflect on, and, and unfortunately, I think I gave it away just after Easter, my sister passed away due to her illness, due to her disease. But she had incredible care. She had compassionate care. She got the treatment, that the best treatment that our state could give her. Our state stepped up and helped to pay for that. And unfortunately, though she passed away, she passed away gracefully. She passed away surrounded by her family. And she passed away under the great care of the great physicians and the great hospitals that this state has to offer. And we were able to help pay for that. Without that, Senator Johnson, I don't know what would have happened. I don't know what condition she would have been in. I don't know what Nebraska, what Omaha, Nebraska, what their care centers would have done. I don't know, I don't know if we could have been there to be with her. I don't know what burden, even if they took care of her, what that bill would have been for uncompensated care. So I just want to kind of make you know and, and remind you that we're all human beings here and there's plenty of tragedy to go around and I'm sure every single person on this building and in this room can tell similar stories. But I just wanted to bring it home for you that if this bill was enacted, my sister 
wouldn't have been able to get the great care and she wouldn't have been able to pass away with dignity. And Madam to Chair. Senator Wicklin. Senator Hayden, I'm truly sorry for the loss, especially now that we're on the anniversary of it. So thank you for sharing that. Thank you, Senator Johnson, Senator Wicklin, and Senator Abler, Senator Marty. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yeah, I, I don't have questions. I, I just want to make a couple comments. Um, I, I could find many different reasons to, to bring up comments about um, concerns I have with this bill, um, but I'll just pick two different areas that I think are very concerning. Um, one of them has to do with, um, as has been discussed, all of the impact on our systems and how this is um, not only going to be costly to develop these systems to handle this process and handle this these new uh, requirements. But I saw in the fiscal note, and I, I apologize I was late, I, I was in local government, but it, it, say, it states in there that implementing this legislation would result in delays to projects in the current METS roadmap, which may have state budget implications and potentially result in federal compliance issues. We, have, we don't even have the, the monetary impact that, that this work is gonna cause. And I would consider it pretty wasteful. I mean, we, we know the concerns that counties and our state have about these systems. We had um, testimony last year and, and presentations last year about how critical these systems are. And we're gonna disrupt that work that they're doing to set up um, this monthly check-in process and um, hire um, many people to administer it. it. It is just, I find, incredibly wasteful. Um, second, I just want to talk a little bit about, you're, you're talking about people that you can sort them in these categories that, you know, maybe will find exemptions for people, um, you know, and they, they won't have to be burdened by this 80-hour um, requirement. But I think it, it really, um, it really ignores that, that there are many low paid workers who are, are fully able, who are not gonna get these exceptions. Um, they're working these $8 an hour jobs and they have no assurance week to week of their schedule. They have, they have no way to say, uh, yeah, I'm gonna get 80 hours this month. They, they, they may go in to work and have their employer say, no, we don't need you today. You can, you, you can go home. Or the next week, maybe they'll get all the hours next week, but maybe the week after that, maybe they just won't be needed. And they have no recourse. They have no ability to say to their employer, you know, this is gonna affect my health care coverage. And then once, once they lose that, then they have to go a whole month. They have to qualify a month of that EDR requirement before they can get reinstated. So what if that's not just one month, it's a month, and then the next month doesn't work out, and then the next month. I mean, this is just ridiculous. Um, you know, and that, that's to say if they're staying healthy during that time that they're gonna be able to just keep working. What if something happens? during that time that they're ineligible. That cost burden on them, uh, you know, it's just, it doesn't make sense. Um, so I, I can't support this and I, I wish we were spending time talking about things that were really, you know, would help people um, figure out how to pay for health care, you know, figure out how to pay, how to manage their health care costs and so that they wouldn't be, uh, you know, above this line that we're looking at even here and, and facing, you know, really <coughs> ridiculous health care costs for health insurance costs that they can't afford, um, facing child care costs that they can't afford. I wish we were working on those issues and not spending time uh, discussing this today. So. Thank you, Madam Thank you, Chair. Senator Wicklund, Senator Marty, then Senator Abler, and uh, last comments for Senator Lori. Uh, sorry, Senator Nelson after Senator Marty. Senator Marty. Thank please. you, Madam Chair. Um, 
Senator Johnson, the Ms. Wright-Meyer, or whatever her name was, the woman who ran the mental health programs in Polk and Manoman and several other counties, I, I would just appeal to you to think about what that means. She may be your constituent or your part of the state at least, but um, when she's talking about what it means to her clinics, because a lot of their people, they, they are gonna cover, the way hospitals are required to do, they're gonna cover people who come to their doors whether they get any money for it or not. And as people are bumped off the program, which they will be bumped off the program, we know that, that's one of the things that there seems to be agreement on, they will be coming into the clinic and the clinic will get less dollars to deal with the people they need. And I just would make a pitch for the people who work at those clinics, the hardworking people who run those clinics, that you be aware of the fact that because maybe there are a lot of people in the public who think somebody's getting something for scot free and you know, they're just, this is wonderful. But it's, it's real people in real clinics who are gonna be hurt. That's why the hospital association testified against it. And the second thing, a few years ago during the national political debates, there was something that people were throwing out the term death panels. And I really think what we're asking the counties to do here, that's why, I mean, Senator Lori's amendment struck me as kind of um, almost tongue in cheek, but um, I actually thought it was not a bad idea because if we're gonna have these things that effectively tell people you're gonna lose your care, we ought to be serving on them too and have to go through the pain of this because I think we might get to know some of these folks and really feel, make decisions based on whether we think it's right or not and could inform our work here. But the third thing, the, one of the reasons you gave for this repeatedly was you wanna help encourage people to work, to have more incentive to work. And, and I think that was very clearly your response to one of Senator Eaton's questions is you really wanna help these people get work. And maybe 10 or 15 feet behind you, there's a guy, I think his name is Willie Riley, he's still there. Um, he said he's worked many jobs, he's a veteran, worked many jobs, he said he's never had paid time off on his jobs, he's never had health care benefits, if I'm, he can correct me if I'm wrong, but I, these are my notes from it. But the thing he was saying at the end, he's struggled with PTSD and anxiety and others, if I have the right notes here, but the thing that hit me, he said, I wish my country loved me as much as I love my country. And he's an individual, I know nothing about him other than what I heard an hour ago or so. Served in the military, served his country, and he's saying he loves his country and he loves us and cares about it. And our response to him is, well, you might lose your health care. And I'm wondering, he said he's got a very strong work ethic. I wonder how is this gonna help him have a stronger work ethic? How will this drive him to get work that he's not already trying to do? Uh, um, Madam Chair, that's it. I'm just curious if you, I, I would encourage you to sit down and talk with him after tonight's hearing and, and just find out. I think it would be instructive for you and for all of us to hear how somebody like this could help a person who served his country and, and I think a very moving testimony. Thank you, and to Senator Abler, Senator Nelson, and then Senator Lori. Thanks, and I'll just be brief. I uh, appreciate all the people who came to testify. I understand uh, the concerns pretty well and I don't think I take this very lightly. Um, but I'll tell you what I'm concerned about. I've sat through a big deficit we made some pretty hard choices, including this group, which was right in the crosshairs of that. Um, we're sitting in the crosshairs of not having enough way to hire enough PCAs to work for our people that are even more vulnerable than the group we're talking about now, plus the people who we're, we're talking. Uh, we have a hard time finding up workers to work for our seniors in nursing homes and pay them adequately under bipartisan leadership. And so none of this is an easy choice. And when, and this, this committee, of all the committees, is seen by many as a bank and on a bipartisan basis. And so the, the thing that I see beneficial about this, and I commend the author for sitting through all this, this is a, you're never coming back to this committee again. <laughs> I sit a, on judiciary, so oh, this is, oh yeah, this this is, is a nice. Happened, yeah. um, but so, I don't, I, this is the first I've seen the bill in its full form, it's the first I've seen the fiscal note. Uh, and this is, as Senator Jensen well said, the start of a discussion. This isn't the last form the bill is going to be in, but this is the start of a discussion. 
If indeed there are 74,000 people, according to the department, that are going to fall into this pretty narrow range, that's an interesting number to me. And I'm concerned about the mental health side. I've been persuaded even before this came to now. What about the mental health individuals, those people who look all right but really are incapable, and people who have PTSD, and God bless the veterans. I'm working on a project in Elka, sir, and we are committed deeply to our veterans. And thank you for your service. And this is nothing about that. But let's say there's 20,000, 30,000 individuals who actually could just as well be working. And so what happens, the old, you know, who's uh, on the program that doesn't belong there continues to haunt all the discussions, not of just this topic, but of our whole committee. And it makes it impossible for us to get the PCAs to work, uh, to get people out of bed. Do you know there's people right now who can't find a PCA, cannot find a PCA, and they're quadriplegics, and they spend time in bed until someone gets them out of bed. And I can't get the money to help them because of people's perception. If nothing else happens out of this project, we will be sure that there's everybody working who should be, and those who can't be or want to move along the course on the, the history of the, the successes of MFEP, that we can move to get done with this conversation. Because it's not over yet. So the people in the audience who care so much about individual groups, so do I. So let's find ways to truly isolate individuals who should be guarded and, and nurtured and helped to become as successful as they can be. We've just spent a great deal of time last year in the WIOA moving people out of sheltered workshops who can into more uh, open working environments. That's really hard to do, but it's important, and there's money being spent to accomplish that. And so, uh, that, Senator Johnson, I uh, appreciate the discussion you're starting, and I'm happy to be a part of it. And for today, I'm going to vote to move this thing along to continue the discussion. I do think we need to find a way to deal with this mental health part, and I'll work with you on that along the way. But, but to, to the members and to the people watching, we have to make sure that every dollar we spend is spent the way we think it should be spent. And then we can make sure that everybody who really needs what we have can get it. And that's my commitment, and I thank all the audience and everybody for that. Senator Nelson. Thank you, Madam Chair, committee. Uh, it's been a hard hearing, uh, yet I know how important I, I believe, Senator Johnson, that you are committed to um, we do want everyone who's able to work to work. Meaningful work is an important part of life. And I, um, while there are things that uh, aren't uh, totally clear here as far as uh, people with mental health uh, concerns and making sure that they continue to receive the, the counseling and the uh, therapy and such is needed. Um, I do believe that this is an important issue, uh, that we do seek to have able-bodied, childless adults uh, working. It's, it's a good thing when people can work. The question is uh, able-bodied, and do we have enough clarity in this bill to make sure that uh, we are not in any way affecting or taking uh, health care from those who are unable to work. So um, I'll be supporting the bill tonight to move it on. I know you, there's more work to do on this bill. I know I'll see it again in Finance Committee, but I do believe that um, work, uh, meaningful work is an integral part uh, of our lives and something that we would uh, want everyone to have that opportunity for. And the question is, do we have the bill in front of us today that allows for that? But I, I think uh, that's what we do in committees. We hear bills. We listen to people who would possibly be affected by the legislation in front of them. And then that's what the committee process does. It refines what is started and it makes it better. And I'm sure that that will happen as this goes forward. Thank you, Senator Lori. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, well, we just heard a little uh, concern about balancing the budget in HHS. I'm going to just cover real quickly again some of the effects. I mean, I went over it, 113 million lost federal revenue on page 11, uh, 26 million that uh, on page 13 of the fiscal note. That's $140 million of lost federal revenue in one year before it's fully implemented. And in that same year, 
before it's fully implemented, we spend seven million more dollar, Minnesota dollars in order to lose those dollars. This is compounded by having just lost $120 million in our ill-fated 1332 waiver where they threw us under the bus on the BHP effects. I mean, we, you know, 140 and 120 is, uh, you know, $260 million of lost federal revenue. That's money that, that does flow into Minnesota's health care system and helps support people in gaining health so that they can get to work. And again, I'm going to harp on Minnesota has the highest work participation, the second highest work participation rates in the country. And it's because of our investment in the health of our people and our populations. And the feds share in that investment. And we're giving away $160 million of that federal investment. It doesn't make any sense. This doesn't work. We need to balance a budget. This, uh, this moves us farther and farther away from our goal. I mean, I can, I can hardly believe that this bill is going to pass. Uh, but it, it appears that it's going to. Um, and and I, I'm going to make a note, too. This is going to have an effect on our individual market. This is going to drive our individual market rates up. You know, we, could, we are constantly concerned about the cost shift. This is uncompensated care, people. This is a lot of uncompensated care that's going to be picked up by our health care providers, our hospitals and our clinics all around the state. That uncompensated care is the cost shift that we're so worried about, that our private insurance market is going to have to pick up the tab for. And we're going to see it if, if we were to do this. Now, I, I don't think this is going to get across. You know, I think that it, I'm listening to the speeches tonight. It sounds like it's going to pass this committee. I don't think it should. But these are the effects. And I'm going to say, too, oftentimes it's been said tonight these are unintended consequences. Once you're put on notice and you see on paper that it's going to happen, it's no longer an unintended consequence. When it happens, it's intended. Um, I'm going to take note that this is Holy Thursday. And we denied a reverend the opportunity to come and give her faith perspective to us tonight. We didn't have the time for the reverend to come forward and give us her faith perspective on the decision that we're making tonight. I think that bears notice. And, you know, one last thing. We actually do have some very recent... Um, perspective on what work requirements do. We implemented work requirements in 2014 for our SNAP program, food supports. And in that first year of implementation, 47,000 people lost access to their food. And only 6,000 people remained on access. And the, the, you know, the goal, as stated, was to move people to work. Not a one of those 47,000 people found a job. They're now, un they, they turned unemployed and hungry. Now they're going to be unemployed, hungry, and without access to health care. And I think that's just wrong. I mean, and then, you know, the budget issue, somebody just texted me a pretty good line. You know, oftentimes, and it was said earlier tonight, life can turn on a dime. I think that was... Um, Mr. Kerr, his life turned on a dime. And a dime is what Minnesota puts forward for this. The feds pick up 90% of the cost. Minnesota puts up that dime that life turns on. And to me, I'll spend that dime every day of the week, twice on Sunday, to bring in 90 cents federal money to support the health and the welfare of the population of Minnesota. I'm going to vote no, and Madam Chair, I'd, I'd like a roll call. Roll call has been requested. A roll call will be granted. Senator Johnson, closing comments. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you for the comments tonight. Um, you know, I just I want to get back to the, the basic principle of this bill. This bill is about encouraging healthy, able-bodied individuals who are currently unemployed to re-engage with their communities. I don't think that is anything that any one of us would disagree with. I want to end with a little quote by uh, former Senator Coleman. 
There are all sorts of good things that come with a job, not the least of which is health insurance. The best welfare program is a job. The best housing program is a job. There's di dignity that comes with a job. The impact it has on the family and the lessening of pressures that one sees in a family. There's a whole range of great things that happen. With that, Madam Pre uh, Chair. Um, Bill. Thank you, Senator Johnson. Senator Matthews renews his motion that Senate File 3611, as amended, be recommended to pass and sent to the Committee on Finance. The clerk will take the roll. Chair Benson? Aye. Senator Jensen? Abstain. Senator Lori? No. Senator Abler? Yes. Senator Eaton? No. Senator Fishbach? Yes. Senator Hayden? No. Senator Kiffmeyer? Yes. Senator Klein? No. Senator Marty? No. Senator Matthews? Yes. Senator Nelson? Yes. Senator Rosen? Yes. Senator Wickland? There being seven yes votes, six no votes, and one abstention, Senate File 3611 is passed. Thank you, Senator Johnson. Members, Thank we you, Chair have, members. We have two bills that are on the table. We would like to move those to general orders. Um, Senator Jensen is uh, an author on Senate File 2836, and so Senator Jensen, I ask that you take Senate File 2836 from the table. Please move it. And um, so, say so moved. I move the bill. And um, members, uh, Senate File 2836 be recommended to pass and placed on general orders. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Senate File 2836 is placed on general orders. Um, Senator Jensen is a co-author on Senate File 3480. Senate File 3480 is, Senate File 3480 is taken from the table. Um, Senate File 3840 as amended is recommended to pass and be placed on general orders. All those in favor say aye. I'm Opposed? Senate File 3480 is on general orders. Thank you, members. We are adjourned.